Our goal here is to uh, address a topic which is emotional, challenging, maybe intractable, and perhaps has been made more so by the events of this past week. But our task as a European Center and our guests as well is to try to look a little more closely at the scene, the underlying scene, which is affected by the events of this week, which is to say refugees and migration, and to try to do so in a way which is uh, analytical, not free of emotion, not free of judgment, but hopefully insightful, and will help us to address some of the complicated questions raised by these events. In October of this year, the head of the Slovenian Red Cross was asked if he and his country were ready for a flow of migrants. And he said, yes, we could handle about 2,500 a day. We are ready. By the end of that week, 84,000 people had poured across the border, in this case from Croatia, after the border of Hungary was closed. The number was 12 times the size of the entire police force of Slovenia. In November, the European Union celebrated the first transfers of people from Italy and Greece under the program they had managed to pass for resettlement of refugees. Undertaking this, a total of 116 people were transferred. During that time, more than 600,000 have come through Greece alone. Others, of course, have crossed through the Mediterranean. Could I have my first slide? I'm going to try to push a little content. The numbers, of course, are only estimates. They are constantly changing. You'll see in this first slide, uh, right, thank you. The first slide is an estimate based on the number of asylum claims. Now, of course, not all refugees make such claims, um, but this gives a rough estimate. You can almost guess that it's 10% higher, um, but you can see uh, the numbers. Next slide, please. The routes that people take are, are dangerous and arduous through, the, through Turkey into, the, into Greece and up through the Balkans, across the Mediterranean. And that is, of course, only after they get to those embarkation points, many having started in Sudan, Eritrea, Afghanistan, uh, or elsewhere. Of course, next slide, please. Many do not make it at all. This is the origins of most, the overwhelming number are from Syria. This is January through August of 2015. And as I mentioned, many, too many, and of course, as my, our participants know all too well, don't make it at all, including, of course, um, three-year-old Island Kurdan, whose picture was, um, became the face of this um, challenge uh, when, his, when his body was photographed on the beach in Greece after leaving from, after leaving from Turkey. <clears throat> the responses have been both national, by Italy, by Greece, by Turkey, which itself has 2 million refugees, most of them from Syria, by Hungary. The EU has come up with a plan, which I referred to already, of relocating 160,000 people, again, a very small number. And it is desperately trying to hold together one of the hallmarks of the European Union, which is to say the Schengen system. We have seen probably the most unseemly and shameless blaming since the Balkan Wars, with Hungary blaming Germany, Slovakia blaming 
the eu and calling their policies a diktat this is a full member of the eu the swedes and the germans lecturing the east europeans the eu blaming the conflict on upheaval in the middle east itself and of course blaming turkey at which it acts as a funnel at least for one of the routes the eu itself is blamed for doing too little too late and crucially the electorates in eu countries are blaming their governing leaders for doing too little could i see the next slide <clears throat> next one after that uh, next one after that right is that a full, a full slide show mode? no full screen or it doesn't share okay um this is a little hard to read but it shows the concerns of the public and their dissatisfaction with their governing bodies' actions. The red, the orange, you can see quickly, um, indicates disapproval of their own government's action. And we're seeing that in elections which have shifted to more, shall we say, conservative or even right-wing parties. Um, in Croatia and Poland, we see the rise of substantial anti-immigrant anti politics. Um, in other parts of Europe, in Great Britain and, and, and France, and if you're paying attention, ironically and somewhat perversely, even in the United States, which has only pledged to take the tiniest share of Syrian refugees, which has already prompted 18 governors to say, not in my town. I'm proud to say that the mayor of Pittsburgh, um, Bill Peduto, has indicated that he will not be part of such xenophobia and has welcomed, has welcomed such immigrants, though the numbers, of course, um, will be small. So the question to focus on the refugee movement for a moment is why is this happening now? What are the push factors creating this unprecedented human flow? What are, what are, the, what are the reasons beyond the, the obvious, the violence and the upheaval? Is it so much worse now? Has it changed now? And how do we assess the European response, both in the government and at the intergovernmental level, but also at the human level, which I do want to talk about? As people watch these events, uh, are we getting only the headlines of the bombing of immigrant centers and anti-immigrant marches? Are we missing a broader story there, especially one which our guests might be aware of since they work on in, in NGOs, two of them work in NGOs that work on this area. This is a huge existential test for the European Union. I would argue it's a more important it's test more even than the because it goes to the heart of what the EU is supposed to do and supposed to be. <laughs> to assess these dynamics um, and their responses, we've assembled an outstanding panel Joanna Kakiskis is a journalist and foreign correspondent for National Public Radio. She was born in Greece and reports there now for NPR, but has also written, for, written articles for Time, Foreign Policy, The New York Times, The Financial Times, and Politico. She won't be able to join us with video, but she's on, she's on an iPhone, and we hope to be able to include her. Okay. Hello, Joanna, can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm on the phone. I'm sorry, my uh, Wi-Fi is so bad that uh, I can't connect by video. My apologies. Well, we're, hap we're happy to have you. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Alessandro Bertani has joined us. He is um, an attorney who practiced law in Italy until he left his firm in 2005 to join the staff of Emergency, Emergency is the Italian-based uh, medical organization which provides services to displaced people and others in need. He is now their vice president and responsible for their operations as well as their, as their donations. We are joined also by Brigadier Martin Zwerer, who is director of the Migrant Offshore Aid Station, or MOAS, an organization which goes out to sea to save people, has saved more than 12,000 such people who have tried to make it 
across the Mediterranean and now expanding into the Aegean. Previously, General Zwereb was Malta's chief of defense, and he has served as Malta's representative to NATO and the defense attache uh, in Belgium and national representative to the EU military. It only takes a moment to look at the map of the Mediterranean to see how significant Malta is in all of this. We hope to have a fourth participant, Andre Segre, a director of film, both documentary film and films for television, uh, including The Closed Sea, which just played here in Pittsburgh, about the Italian policy of sending people back, most in this case, to Libya. I don't see Dr. Segre with us, and I'm wondering if you'll excuse me if I can ask if he's on the phone anywhere. All right. I hope he can. I hope he can join us. Um, he did offer the very understandable excuse that he's on deployment with the Italian Navy and may very well not not be able to uh, to join us. Um, Alessandro, I'd like to begin with you, if I might, by asking you why it is so different. These two years, have things changed dramatically? After all, violence, upheaval, and war are not new to the Middle East. Um, have things changed so much? Are there push or pull factors that have made the last two years dramatically different than the previous ones? Don't forget to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. How do we have me? First of all, thank you for inviting me to join in this discussion. It's very uh, interesting and uh, the topics are very interesting. And <clears throat> I think that the push factors in the past two years has, have changed in this way. Um, we believe that uh, the most uh, uh, important push factors that we see uh, in people coming uh, to Europe uh, um, can be summarized in two words, uh, war and poverty. If I think uh, of the past two years, and I think uh, uh, of the work that we have done in the past two years, I can only see that uh, our work in uh, uh, war zone areas uh, um, has increased dramatically. Uh, we've been working in Libya, uh, where we have uh, recently opened uh, a war uh, uh, hospital for war victims. Uh, if I think uh, of Afghanistan, a country in which we have been working uh, since 1999, so. Uh, well before uh, the last uh, war uh, involved in the, the country. Well, in the past four years, uh, um, we have recorded the fourth year in a row that uh, um, we uh, had uh, the highest number of uh, patients as war victims in our hospitals. Um, and we have opened uh, also uh, five more uh, first aid posts in the, the most uh, uh, war affected zones in the country. I think uh, of the Central African Republic, uh, uh, we have been uh, working uh, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in a surgical ward uh, in a war hospital because of the war in the country. If I think of Iraq, we've been working in uh, uh, five uh, IDPs and uh, uh, refugees camps in, in the country to assist uh, people escaping from uh, uh, Syria and uh, northern uh, Iraq uh, for the escaping from the uh, conflicts in those areas. And uh, also, if I think uh, of Sierra Leone, um, which is a country uh, devastated by the last uh, emergency last year, uh, Ebola, I mean, uh, which has um, put the country uh, on its knees uh, um, after war and poverty affecting uh, um, the situation there for, for many years. Uh, these are the push factors that uh, we believe uh, push people to uh, leave their countries and uh, uh, seek uh, refugees, um, uh, seek hospitality and aid uh, in, uh, in Northern Europe uh, more than uh, uh, probably in the past years. And um, this is the, the scenario that uh, we are facing uh, when we work in, uh, in those countries. And, uh, and we believe these are the key factors now. General Zwerab, would you say those same factors have contributed to the in, what appears to be an increase in Mediterranean crossings, which must be 
certainly the most dangerous that people travel thousands of miles before they even begin that crossing and a and a person and in a safe environment like ours has to wonder what is driving that increase unmute again unmute okay first of all thank you for for having us for having them all us um before i answer to your question i'd like to point uh something out because it has repeatedly this has repeatedly been saying as um or termed as as a, a an issue of europe an issue of the european union uh, as a foundation we really think that it needs to go beyond europe uh, we think what is happening in the central mediterranean now um, is an issue, is a global issue that requires global solutions. So um, as a starting point, I'd like to say that we would like to widen the scope of, of trying to find a solution to what is most definitely a, a global issue. With regards to the causes and why this has escalated over the past two, three years, um, in, 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 first of all, in terms of people leaving Africa, um, there is more than one route, uh, um, more than one country of origin. You have the Central African route, and now increasingly this year, um, the, sorry, the Central Mediterranean route, and now increasingly this year, the Eastern Mediterranean route. In terms of the Central Mediterranean route, I think um, this has remained more or less constant for the past few years. Um, what we have seen an escalation is in the Eastern Mediterranean route, and that is linked directly with the escalating situation, particularly in Syria. Um, there are more and more people in, in refugee camps in Turkey and in Lebanon and Jordan. And we assess that while some would have stayed in refugee camps hoping um, to eventually go back to Syria, now matters have escalated to a point um, that people truly feel no other option but to leave either Syria or the refugee camps. Um, the people we take on our boat, the people we save at sea, all um, speak with the same voice. They keep saying that if they have an option, had they had an option, they would have never left their homeland. However, they feel that they truly, truly have no option. They are escaping the same terror that we are facing, that we have faced this week in Europe. So the issue we are facing, I mean, we are both victims of the same, of the same terror. Um, these are tough and challenging period, um, not only for states, for NGOs, but for citizens of Europe, but they're also challenging, it's a choice of a challenging time for the refugees themselves escaping terror. So yes, in essence, uh, the situation is escalating because in the countries of origin, particularly in this case, Syria, the situation is getting worse and worse. Thank you. Joanna, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. You've heard the responses of General Zwerab and Alessandra Bertani. I'd like if you could to give us a picture of someone. I'm sure you've met people in your reporting who, who fit this profile, that is to say, who would rather stay in their home country and, but against all odds and all rational reasoning, have left. Have you met such people as you've reported on this situation? Yes, absolutely. I've been meeting people like this, leaving and sort of, you know, staggered over the last uh, year and a half. Um, a year and a half ago, people were leaving from a uh, year and a half to two years ago, people were leaving from um, certain areas like a very besieged neighborhood in Damascus called Yarmouk, uh, which is a Syri it was started as a Syrian, uh, I'm sorry, a, a camp for Palestinian refugees and quickly became a very integrated part of Damascus, a business center. A lot of Syrians also lived there. Um, but they were the first people that I met and they were all very successful business people. Uh, well-educated, many with advanced degrees. Um, I met a couple of doctors. I met uh, a geologist, uh, 
uh, you know, an economist, accountants, teachers, you name it. Um, and then I started to see people from other parts of Syria coming uh, over the course of, uh, of, of the last year and a half to two years. And just today, um, actually, this morning, uh, I met a math, um, I'm sorry, yesterday, she was on the air this morning, <laughs> morning edition. I met a mathematician um, who had just left because of Russian bombing. Um, people are staying um, as 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 long as they can because to them, uh, Syria, even in it in the form that it's in now, which is really a disaster, uh, this is uh, this is their home, and it takes a lot to tear somebody away from it, even if they've seen the worst kind of bloodshed around them. Uh, and to echo the statements made. Uh, Everybody I've met has experienced some kind of terror or threat or violence from Islamic State. Um, and uh, that's one reason, a big reason that many people are also fleeing in combination with, um, with, with attacks from the regime, being jailed by the regime of, uh, of Bashar al-Assad and, uh, and, and just other factors. People literally don't have anything to hold on to. Um, I've also met Iraqis. I've met lots of Iraqis, also very well educated, fleeing, fleeing Islamic State violence in their country. And today I, I met, uh, yesterday, I keep saying today because the story aired today, but I met a really interesting um, soil scientist from Somalia who made a very good point. He said, everybody I meet at this refugee camp, we're fleeing al-Shabaab. Uh, there are people who are fleeing Boko Haram. There are people who are fleeing Islamic State, you know, in, in two countries. Uh, the, the, as many of the Hazara Afghans uh, he, he met and I've met, he said, they're, they're fleeing the Taliban. Everybody is fleeing something. And, and many people often try to stay as long as they can because it's not like they're trying to come and invade a new country and make it their own. They, people love their countries and they love their cultures and they've worked really hard to make a life there. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, is it too deadly to stay here? Am I going to die? Am I going to go nowhere? Am I going to you know, be living hand to mouth if I stay at a refugee camp in Lebanon or Jordan or Turkey? Um, and those are very real questions. And I meet people every time I report and go out and do a reporting assignment like I am now on. I'm, I'm, I'm on Lesbos at the, at the moment, which is why I don't have a good Internet connection. Uh, every day, every time I, I, I go on an assignment, I meet people like that. Uh, Alessandro, <clears throat> these answers, in a way, su suggest that uh, it almost doesn't matter what Europe does. In other words, none of you mentioned, uh, or, or I'm giving you the opportunity to do it now, that let's say the German open door policy or the Swedish open door policy was a crucial factor in all of this because the situations have gotten so much worse that people would be driven to try to leave anyway. Uh, or, for example, you see statements that say that Turkey has not done enough because it is the it is a clear route, especially for those going to Lesbos and to Greece. But it sounds like these desperate conditions would drive people into this desperate action anyway. Sorry, I, I missed your last words because of connection. Well, what I meant was, um, if these desperate conditions have not only bad but gotten worse, then in a way yes. Europe's response is less crucial to understanding what's happening here. Or is that a mischaracterization? Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, Europe's response, uh, well, I, I had the feeling in the past years that uh, we as Europeans, as Europe, uh, European countries, uh, had a sort of a, a middle age approach. We are, you know, closing doors of our castle, um, building new barriers, and uh, instead of removing the causes of uh, uh, migrations, uh, you know, uh, as pointed out uh, earlier, uh, the key factors are very uh, desperate for people, and uh, they, you can't just stop uh, the flow of people from from those countries unless you start uh, thinking of uh, how uh, how to remove uh, 
the causes for migration. Uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, um, declarations by uh, government X or government, government uh, Y uh, for uh, welcoming people or uh, uh, pushing away people uh, as much influence on the decision of leaving uh, their own countries uh, as long as the conditions there are those we, we, all, we all know very well. General Sawyer, I'd like to ask you, staying with the European response for a moment, there's often a discussion between making the distinction between a refugee or perhaps an asylum claimant who may have a legitimate right as seen by Europe and an economic migrant who seems <laughs> by de facto situation not to be. Is that a meaningful distinction? Can Europe really adopt a policy either at the national or international level that's based on that, or has the time for making such a distinction passed? Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I hope I, I managed to get get uh, um, the gist of your question, because for a minute you, you were off there. I think you were asking, uh, um, should we continue making the distinction between a refugee and an economic migrant? Did I get that right? Yes, that's correct. That's right. Yes, I, th I think essentially um, both the refugee and the economic migrant leave because um, they feel they have no option but to do so. Um, obviously, the reasons are different. And I think um, up to a certain extent, uh, Yes, um, we need to make that that sort of we need to make that sort of distinction. From a MOAS perspective, out at sea, we do not make that distinction because we feel that whoever uh, feels compelled to do the crossing, um, fully aware of how dangerous it is, they they do not deserve to die at sea. So they deserve to to to, to be assistance uh, assisted. Obviously, I mean, at the minute, uh, Europe is, is uh, um, uh, hopefully no one takes any knee-jerk reactions. Um, uh, Europe wants to gain control of her external borders, and particularly at this time, we need to understand the concerns um, of people, of governments, of the man in the street. Um, I think there will be also uh, an attempt to implement um, additional checks also. But what I think is important now, whether they're economic migrants or whether they're refugees, I think we should not turn away, uh, turn our backs away um, to those that are running away. Uh, particularly, um, this is um, keeping in mind what happened in France last Saturday, particularly those that are running away um, from, from terrorists. Um, my concern is that if we turn our backs to those who are asking for help, then we also play in the hands of those who want to terrorize. Um, this is a situation um, which is, is happening. We don't have control over it. Um, the only thing we can do, but this is not the short term, it's not even the medium term, it's the long term, is try and find solution upstreams in country of or countries of origin. I think the previous speaker also said that um, uh, if we want to, to, to address the root causes, then, then we, need, we, we have to do so and we should do so, but that is not in the immediate. The immediate are millions of people displaced out of their homeland, feeling that they have no option. Now, um, uh, yes, I think there will eventually be a distinction because um, refugees are a distinctive um, group of people who are um, termed as such, who are escaping um, certain situation to which they can't go back to. However, in terms of assisting those in distress, I do not think we should make that distinction. I, I want to stay with you for a moment. Uh, uh, before uh, I'm going to come back to you because I see Alessandro has his hand up. Yes, Alessandro, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add a, a couple of words on this point because it's very interesting. You know, I, I live in Italy, I'm Italian, and I'm part of a country uh, which has probably more than uh, 5 million uh, expatriates in the world because of uh, 
what we call economic reasons. And uh, uh, one, one information that uh, I just want to share with you is that uh, uh, I think a few of you know that uh, in 2014, uh, the immigration and immigration balance uh, um, uh, for Italy was negative meaning that we had more Italians uh, living in the country for economic reason, the uh, migrants are coming to Italy for whatever reason. And whatever reason, I mean, uh, when we make the distinction between refugees and uh, um, uh, economic uh, uh, migrants, I mean, uh, the, the two factors are so connected because uh, of war and poverty, which is, I, I don't think it makes sense to, to make any distinction in this, uh, in this case. Um, actually, you, your, your point points to my next question. Uh, I'm going to turn back to Joanna. Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, yes. One of the ironies of European reaction is that Europe has seen many periods of substantial migration, most recently at the end of the Cold War, from east to west, East Europeans, Poles, Lithuanians, Germans, displaced, uh, people from the Balkan Wars displaced, and the European reaction at that time seemed much more welcoming and supportive, at least compared to now. When you interview people or talk to policymakers, have they forgotten their own past, or is this a case of treating people who come from the Middle East, who are Muslim, uh, who have different cultures, differently than, than people that are seen as Europeans? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think um, politicians naturally have a short uh, memory and they serve uh, whatever short-term interests they need to serve to get reelected. Um, I've heard time and time again policymakers point out that the migration issue is so easily um, hijacked by uh, by populists who know that it's an easy way to 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 instill fear and to get easy votes that way, votes out of fear. Um, that happens. I'm a glad lot. that doesn't happen it, here. Yeah, um, isn't that isn't that a relief? <laughs> I, I, uh, I yes. just had a discussion. Uh, the discussion happening in my former. I used to live in North Carolina, and I was seeing some of the stuff from my old newspaper, the News and Observer, and I'm just like, no, no, not there too. Um, but uh, anyway, the, that, that 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 happens a lot, and it's as a journalist, I sort of expect it from most politicians. Um, and you know, in talking, if you talk to some of the Eastern European politicians. I mean, they're very insular, and uh, like the the, the 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 politicians in Slovakia, it's a tiny country that's extremely nationalistic and very insular, and uh, and and that's the only way the prime minister now knows how to get get votes. You know, Viktor Orban to the right, because Vupic was was capitalizing on this issue. They're they're extreme far right party, so he thought, okay, I'll just hijack those issues and turn into a far right extremist myself. And, it, it, you see this happening a lot because people are thinking about short-term goals. It, 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 that's clear. However, uh, I do think there's a bias against people in the Middle East because if you talk to, uh, for example, I was in Bratislava recently for a conference in Slovakia, and they have a pretty small, but you know, it, it's it's still a sizable. <laughs> A Vietnamese community of people who came over uh, during the Cold War to study, and you know it's about four thousand people, but they're they're there. They're in a in a country that's you know largely homogenous, but there's a, a a group of people who are not Christian, who are not white, and who have established a foothold in in a very insular country. And when I asked people about the Vietnamese community, when I said, well, you know, you've got, you've had an experience with with immigration before. I mean, you 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 did it back when you were part of Czechoslovakia. Oh no, 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 but they're they're harmless. You know, the uh, the new people are Muslims, and they're going to come and wreak havoc here. I mean, they were very even the most progressive people I talked to in Bratislava were saying that. Uh, and some of my Polish friends, when I talked to them about uh, about the, the, the about refugees and migrants coming now, all of them are are one way or another they'll say something that indicates that they're afraid. And uh, 
so it, 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 it's, it's, it's really disappointing because in many ways Europe has a real opportunity here because this is a continent that, that's losing, um, you know, it's aging. And it's, it, 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 you have an opportunity to, to, to really embrace well-educated young people to become part of your country. But there's this phobia that every young man that's coming uh, and who's Syrian uh, or Iraqi uh, who's a Muslim is going to turn into an extremist. Um, that's that's just stacks everything against them. So uh, so yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. General Zwerab, you have your hand up. No, he's not on you. Yeah, but he has to control it. I don't have control. <laughs> Can't hear you, General. Okay. Um, yes, I yes. just want to go back on something I said before. Um, I said that there is a distinction between um, refugees and economic migrants. What I did say as well is that uh, our uh, our reaction or our our um, reaction towards them or how we should deal with them should not necessarily be 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 different. I mean, if if someone is in need of assistance, then that someone is in need of assistance. But in terms of refugees, there is a process, and that is uh, and that is distinct. Again, I think um, yes, I heard uh, um, Joanna very clearly, and I agree totally with what she was saying. Um, in the case of Slovakia, I was there a couple of of, of months ago, um, and I understand fully what she has, what she is saying. Unfortunately, for politicians, the trap of falling into populist rhetoric is very easy. Um, our politicians think in terms of one election to another election. Um, unfortunately, in the great majority of cases, um, our leaders. Um, uh, lead less and follow more, whereas, whereas they should have the more courage to lead more and, and follow less. However, again, I want to expand this, this discussion beyond Slovakia and beyond Europe, uh, because today I believe we have a situation where um, we have a number of, of governors in the US who, who have said no to to refugees, and these would be refugees that would have been vetted and, and cleared uh, in, in more than one way. Um, so again, if, if we're at a point where we're even saying no to refugees simply on the basis because they come from the Middle East, um, I think there we have an issue which we need, which we need to, to, uh, to address. Alessandro, that's a good point for me to ask you this question. That what appears to be the distinction between at least some politicians and political parties expressing anti-immigrant fears that, that uh, Joanna characterized, and the lack of leadership that General Zwerer characterized, and, hum and enormous numbers of acts of humanity, including those of your organization and MOAS, um, which defy an easy description as people being terrified of, of immigrants. Uh, is, so are we, I guess what I'm trying to say, are we missing an important social story here, one of humanities, at least European humanities, welcoming, but it's blotted out by the headlines of nasty politics, politicians? Well, yes. <clears throat> I also have the feeling that sometimes uh, uh, the media uh, try to drive uh, um, this problem uh, uh, based on fear, and fear, you know, is a big enemy of humanity because uh, uh, certainly uh, people, when when people are feared, uh, uh, it's more difficult to uh, you know share rights, share uh, aid, and uh, share humanity uh, with other people, especially if. Uh, uh, migrants are uh, yes. depicted like uh, those are coming to uh, grab you something, to you know, uh, put you in danger in terms of uh, your social life and work. Uh, unless, uh, um, while in in the past, uh, especially when uh, probably the key factors uh, of media were uh, 
more uh, focused on humanity, uh, there was a more um, easy approach and more, uh, um, there was more willingness uh, in people for uh, helping other people uh, coming from uh, those difficult countries. Uh, media have uh, a bigger responsibility in, in this and uh, uh, I would like uh, that uh, at a certain point somebody will uh, will address this issue because uh, um, you know we live uh, uh, in, in in a world of media we are bombed by information uh, sometimes uh, uh, too much information uh, and um, without uh, uh, putting the focus on uh, uh, real problems, uh, real causes uh, for migration. Before I turn to uh, some questions that relate to recent events, I want to give the opportunity to any of our partners whose students are here or students here in this room to raise a question to any of our panelists or on the topic uh, in general. People who are not sitting in this room and people who are in this room need to raise their hands, otherwise I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. Yes, Martin, Professor Stanland from Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, I'd just like to ask, because I haven't seen numbers recently, whether the numbers approaching the borders have dwindled or are getting greater. We don't hear very much now about what we were hearing about a few weeks ago. So I would welcome some clarification of whether this tide is in any way uh, flowing, is going down or up. Were you able to hear the question? Yes. Anyone want to venture an answer? Well, I can tell you what I've been seeing on Lesbos. I mean, this is, uh, okay, so about 650,000 uh, migrants have entered through this route, which is called the Eastern Mediterranean route from Turkey to Greece so far this year. And of that number, about half have come on Lesbos, on the island I'm on right now. Uh, at its peak, 9,000 to 10,000 people were coming here in September and October, uh, some, sometimes every day of the week. Uh, these days, it's down to about 3,000 a day, but it's still 3,000 a day. And for November, which is a month where you you really see the numbers going way down, like, you know, in the couple hundreds even, you know, a day, if even, to still get 3,000 people a day um, at this time of year is significant. Yes, there's been a decrease, but the, the, the decrease is still a huge influx. Thank you. Yes. Um, I just want to touch on a point that um, I think Joanna made about um, kind of the insular nature of politicians. Um, and just question whether or not there's like a real fix for insular kind of xenophobic ideologies. Um, uh, I think Alessandra or Martin touched on the um, US governors who rejected the possibility of taking in Syrian refugees. And the list comes from generally um, conservative states. Actually, all of them except for one are Republican. Um, and all of them kind of have the same rhetoric of, well, we want to ensure that our citizens are safe. And I think that just basic research would show that like, the overwhelming like, majority of Syrian refugees aren't a threat or a danger. So I think, is there a real fix to just kind of this baseless xenophobia? General Swearer, unmute. unmute. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, um, <laughs> uh, listen, in, in, in my mind, uh, um, insecurity is, is understandable, as is anger and disappointment in times like this. But the issue is not that. The issue is what are we going to do about it? Where are we going to channel our energy? And our energy needs to be channeled towards helping those in need. Um, and those in need are the people that are actually running away from um, terrorist acts in their own country. Um, one, one, one thing uh, I have to say is that there has been one, one terrorist suspected to be posing as a refugee, but 
There are millions of refugees escaping terrorists. Um, we meet these people out at sea. We take these people on our boat uh, and we talk to these people. I think to pick up on what something, something that, that Alessandro said, which I think is very important, is the role, the role not only of politicians, but also the role of the media here. Um, we need to put a face to, to statistics. We need to put a face to numbers and think about individuals that, that, that are, are, are taking this leap of faith. Um, these are individuals who, as I said, feel they have no option, but also individuals that are full of hope because to leap into the unknown, then um, they are hopeful. They are hopeful that what they seek and what they seek is very simple very, very simple. They seek security. They, they want to put food on the table for the children. They want to provide them with, with opportunities and with an education. These are the people that have had a life back home in the great majority of cases, particularly in Syria. And again, I join Joanna. Um, this is, this, these are the people we have come across. These are the people who have sold everything they had and decide to start all over again. These are people who three, three weeks, three years ago, four years ago, would have never ever dreamt of leaving their country of origin. So I think um, we, we, um, the way we need to respond is, is to show some moral courage. Um, let us not be naive. Let us all understand um, the fear and the concerns of people in the aftermath of what happened in Paris. But the question we have to ask ourselves now is, OK, so what are we going to do about it? Are we going to succumb to, to, uh, um, to what the perpetrators would like us to do? Are we going to shut our borders further and just simply say, OK, so I don't want any Syrians, I don't want any Muslims here in my land? Or are we going to be a bit grown up and consider the situation as it is? Alessandro, let me ask you to address the European response, the most recent European response at the EU level, which not only included uh, this commitment to resettle 160,000, but a, a, a deal with African countries in which the a European Union promised three or four billion euros worth of aid, presumably to make the situation better there. But the deal also includes, if I'm not mistaken, provisions whereby the African countries have to make it easier for the European countries to send migrants back, which was precisely the tragic story documented in André Segre's uh, film, The Closed Sea, which the Italian government enforced this policy vis-a-vis -vis Libya. Are we seeing the EU adopt this now? region-wide, where it will actually actively push people back into the countries from which they're trying to escape? Well, if you want to stop uh, the flow of people, uh, it has to invest in uh, their own country of origin, invest not peanuts, but, you know, uh, many more uh, money to make sure that the living conditions in those countries uh, uh, become acceptable. And, and then uh, we can discuss about uh, uh, agreements for repatriating people. I mean, uh, if, if we are sure that we are able to eliminate the causes uh, for these people to move. Um, um, this is, I think, uh, the, the, the key point. Uh, if we want to discuss and, uh, and resolve the problem, uh, unless uh, otherwise uh, uh, Europe uh, will uh, will always uh, um, show a face and uh, uh, give uh, the impression uh, to uh, to discuss problems, but uh, they don't want to uh, you know touch the the real base of the problem. Joanna, are you still there? I'm yeah, I'm listening with great interest. These are great responses. 
<laughs> they, they are. We, we choose our panels carefully. Um, and, and that brings me to your home country. One remarkable stories have been coming out about the people in Greece, which everybody in this room knows have suffered their own difficulties, a drop of GDP, high levels of unemployment, years of austerity. And yet, we appear to see wonderful stories of the people on the islands and on the mainland welcoming refugees, uh, and even though they are on the front lines and, and have this enormous number that you described. Um, so I guess I have two questions. Is this just an American romantic view of Greece, or is this really accurate? And if it is accurate, <laughs> how do you explain it? Well, it, it is accurate. Uh, in most parts of Greece, it is accurate, and especially on the island that I'm on now, Lesbos. Lesbos is a, an island that's actually, its descendants are from refugees, from uh, the Asia Minor, uh, the, the, when, uh, when Greece went to war with Turkey in 1922, uh, and, and then in response, after Tur Greece lost the war, Turkey forced out a lot of Greek citizens, and they fled to, to Greece. I mean, I'm sorry, they were Greek uh, nationals, but they were Turkish citizens. And a lot of them came here to Lesbos and, and, and you know, their grandmothers who still remember coming over on the boat, like, you know, screaming. Some of them even sheltered for a time in Syria, their, their you know, their parents had. Uh, and they remember this. And uh, you see them on the shores uh, waiting for what some, sometimes are like 70 boats coming in a day. So that's seven zero, not one seven. Seven zero, like full of 50 or 60 or 70 people per boat. And you see people welcoming them with water, with fruit juice, with diapers, with ponchos. They're hugging them. You see grandmothers picking up babies and saying, here, let me hold your baby for a while while you dry off for the mom. You know, and it's, it's very emotional to see this because it's touching. And it's not just me as somebody who's with Greek heritage. I mean, I've seen multiple international journalists burst into tears watching this volunteers, you know, heads of NGOs, because it's very touching. Um, how, how do I explain it? I mean, I can't say that every part of Greece reacts like this. I've been in other parts. I mean, it, it, for example, on the island of Kos, there, there are some people welcoming refugees, but the mayor there, for example, on that island it, is very anti-immigrant. And so you don't see the warmth on Kos that you see on Lesbos. Uh, and in northern Greece, you don't also you also don't see this kind of warmth. It's maybe something in some ways particular to this island, but at the same time, I think Greeks are by nature uh, uh, people who are hospitable. They're in, they're like the like the Syrians that way. The Syrians are the same way. They for years took in refugees in their country, um, and uh, and they have had a really tough five uh, almost six years. Uh, where they've been scapegoated and humiliated by everybody in the world and called lazy Greeks and loser Greeks and, you know, and uh, it's really, you know, they've really, it's really hit their egos. I mean, yes, they created a lot of their own problems during the, during the economic crisis, but, you know, when you're like a law-abiding Greek, tax-paying Greek citizen and you've lost everything because of some bad economic policy by the European Union, you really do feel bad. You do, you do humiliated internationally, and then you actually lose every cent you have. So it's brought out a lot of compassion in people. People are able to see that when somebody is suffering, what you don't do is humiliate them and scapegoat them. So that's, you know, one explanation to what you see now. I also think the Greeks, like the Italians, have had a lot, have had many years of experience with migrants. Um, they've been seeing people coming to their shores, not in these numbers, but have seen people coming to their shores for 15 years, 20 years. Uh, they're used to it. And I remember um, earlier this summer, a few people sort of, you know, from here, from Lesbos, from Kos, from, from Athens even, people saying, why is everybody freaking out in in the rest of Europe. Have they never seen an immigrant before? Why is it suddenly an immigration crisis or a migrant crisis or a refugee crisis when they go west? Um, they really, there's always been this north-south divide in the migration crisis. And 
it, it, the West response has always been like Italy, uh, Greece, you guys take care of the problem and don't make it ours. And that's not solidarity at all. And that shows one of the big fissures in the European Union, one of the big, biggest problems in the European Union right there. Yes, it's a challenge. I have a feeling it's going to get worse. I want to pass on a question to you from one of our students sitting in an a, a overflow room. Yes, they don't okay. have um, audio. So I will read the question, which is, um, what amount of screening is realistic with the influx of refugees? And everybody is this a question? question for me? It is not specified. It's, Whoever right. wants it. What? Anyone oh. familiar with a screening or vetting process who wants to address that on the, Euro on the European end? Well, I can speak I'll try to get... a little bit from the Greek angle. The, the, the screening here, um, because there's so many people coming, uh, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very specific since I'm on Lesbos, because there are so many people coming on to Lesbos every day, there are 125 Greek officers and about 50 Frontex officers who have to screen literally 3,000 people arriving a day. They don't have much time to do it because it gets very, the, the camp gets very, very full and people start freaking out. And there's nowhere for people to sleep. They sleep in the mud. Um, so an interview, for example, takes about 10 minutes at the most. Um, and the interview would be like to establish nationality, to uh, find out why the person is traveling to the country, uh, to find out if they're faking their nationality, which about 30% of people do, uh, according to Frontex, which is Frontex. Frontex, by the way, is the European Union's border patrol agency. What, and, language, uh, do and they, what language do they use to, to conduct the interviews? Well, the, the Frontex, uh, the Greeks don't have, I think the Greeks have one Arabic speaker, but the Frontex uh, crew has brought over people who speak Arabic, Farsi, um, I'm sorry, Dari, uh, Urdu, uh, people who, who can differentiate between, the, um, among the dialects of Arabic because, for example, a Moroccan will speak Arabic very, very differently from a Syrian. And there, there are people like from Tunisia and Morocco and Algeria who do try to pass themselves off as Syrian. And somebody who knows the dialects and knows the right questions to ask, like, you know, what's your national currency? What is, you know, who was, uh, who's, who's the, who won Arab Idol from your country in this year? I mean, like, whatever. Those kinds of questions they'll ask that maybe somebody only from Syria would know. But they'll also pick up on the on the on the dialects as well. Uh, but the problem here is resources. They just don't have enough people doing this. Uh, and the other problem is there's a, it seems to be and, and maybe maybe um, the others on the panel can address this as well. There seems to be a lack of coordination in the Eurodac system, which is the fingerprinting uh, database. So uh, because there's the, 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 like this. It's hard to know who's a criminal and who's not sometimes. Uh, they do flag a lot of people. I do give them credit for flagging people. But uh, the Greek Minister of Migration said this is something that he would like to see improved. I think it's from, from the Greeks' perspective, it's a matter of needing more resources. And from the Frontex sources I have, they've said the same thing. If they had more resources and more people screening, uh, it would probably put a lot of people's minds at ease. I have several other questions, but before I turn to them, I want to give you, General Zwerer, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. When your organization rescues people at sea, do they begin screening them immediately on the boats, or do they take them back to shore without reference to screening, or how do they handle it? Now, first of all, I have to underline that when we're out at sea, we work in complete coordination with the Rescue Coordination Center, which is a state entity. Um, the way it works for us is we this year we were operating in the Central Mediterranean. We we're actually tasked to go out and, and assist boats in distress. Um, uh, if it is certain that there is, this is a boat in distress, an overloaded boat which requires assistance, then we take people on board and we provide what we refer to as post-rescue care. 
Um, it normally takes us uh, 48 hours to get to, to the point of disembarkation, which would normally be Sicily or southern Italy. In that time, we would have been providing the Italian authorities with the information we can gather um, in terms of gender, in terms of age, in terms of who we think, where we think the people come from. And then we will get uh, um, uh, told, uh, we, we will get directed to a particular port of disembarkation, where then we hand over one by one the people we have saved, our beneficiaries, to the Italian authorities. It is then, the, that is when the screening starts. We actually do, um, we do not do any, any screening um, uh, on, on the board, on the boat ourselves, but obviously for the period they are on the boat, they are contained, and then we hand them over to the authorities, which include not only the police and the judiciary, obviously, but also other NGOs and the, and the state authorities, which are there, to continue providing post-rescue care. If, if you allow me, I would like to make one point which I think has not been raised up till now, um, because, and rightly so, we, we, we have talked about the responsibility that Europe and the rest of the world um, has to people um, fleeing either war or poverty. I would, however, like to highlight that and this, I say this in the wake of the EU-Africa summit, which was held in Malta um, last week. There is also a responsibility of, of, of countries of origin to provide for their citizens. They have also a moral responsibility, whether these are the African nations or whether this is Syria itself, they have a responsibility towards their citizens, which should not be um, underestimated and should be um, underlined. Thank you. Please just identify yourself and speak loudly. Okay, uh, my name is Salam. Um, so I guess my main question is, um, like we've talked about, obviously, like the refugees from the Middle East and why they're immigrating, which I, no one can blame them for. It's a war and they have their own terrorists to deal with. Um, but like those were not the only countries on the list that, that you provided, or like the graph from the BBC. Uh, but like those aren't the only countries where people are, are trying to emigrate from. Um, there were countries in uh, the Balkans, like Serbia and Albania, and I, I mean, and like countries like Eritrea. Um, which like I have visited twice in the past year, they don't have terrorists, you know, they don't have an ongoing war. Um, so I guess other than the obvious poverty, which I mean in both regions they're not like, it's not a foreign to them, why are they trying to emigrate? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna, go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna, I jump in? I, who, who, I, yes, I can't see what's going on. This is Joanna. Okay, this is Joanna. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I have a complete answer, but I have um, a, a perspective based on some reporting. Um, in Germany, for example, uh, many of the people who have claimed asylum in Germany, at least over the course of the last few years, are from the Balkans. And what they do is they go, um, because the, the, the situation in their own countries, in Kosovo, in, uh, in Macedonia, in, in, sometimes in Serbia, it's mostly people from Albania and Kosovo and, and sometimes Bosnia and uh, Macedonia. Uh, the, the economy, the, the unemployment rates are super high. Uh, the job, jobs are non-existent. And so what they do is they go to Germany, claim asylum, knowing they're not going to get it, uh, but they do get uh, like a stipend. If it's a single person, it's about 300 euros. And if it's a family, it's 900 euros until their asylum um, uh, request is denied. And then they're sh shipped back home. Uh, but in the meantime, they make enough in three months to support their families in one year. Uh, now, Germany is said that they're going to create separate um, uh, screening facilities for Balkan migrants from safe countries. Uh, so they can be dealt with quickly, i.e. deported quickly. Uh, but like, for example, in one town on the Bodense in Germany, where I've spent a lot of time doing some research for uh, uh, what I hope will become a good book, 
um, is uh, I, what I saw there was a like a booming black market, basically a, an underground economy with these Balkan migrants, most of whom speak English and can work as and some German and can work at cafes like for tourists. Like they, there are a lot of tourists on in Friedrichshafen because the Bowdoin Day is like a little. You know, it's by this uh, by this big lake. There are a lot of little cafes, lots of little you know water sports and stuff nearby. And you know, they the people pay them under the table. They work, they make some money, and then they come back. Um, and so uh, the uh, and that and that money can be used to uh, sit, like again support their families for an entire year almost uh, in most cases. Uh, but you're right. It's uh, it's it's not a question of safety in in near, in none of these cases. You can make that ar- the argument that maybe for the Roma who were mistreated all over Europe, uh, they could make a case that they're mis- that they, they have a hard time in whatever country they're coming from, whether it's you know um, a Balkan country or Romania or Hungary or whatever. Um, but uh, b- by and large, uh, these are going to be, and they already have been marked safe countries by Germany, uh, and they will be um, quickly deported. General Zura, you wanted to say something about this question. Yes, I, I just wanted to to respond to to the to the point raised by the girl about about Eritrea. Um, in effect, in 2014, the bulk of the people we saved at sea were Syrians, and these were Syrians. Uh, um, these were Syrians that were uh, um, taking planes actually to Algeria, then crossing to Libya, and then taking the Central Mediterranean route. In 2015, that has changed because most were using the Eastern Mediterranean route. Um, So the largest number crossing the Central Mediterranean route in 2015 um, were actually Eritreans. And uh, uh, again, yes, we have spoken a lot about what is happening in Syria, but um, let us not focus solely on Syria. I mean, in Eritrea, you have a regime a dictatorship that has been in power for 22 years. We have endless and decades people spending decades on 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 national service. Um, so you have an 18-year-old en- entering the national service, thinking he's going to spend a few months or maybe a year in national service, and then it's never ending. It's 10 years. It's fi- it's 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 15 years. There are. There are mass incarcerations in places like Eritrea. Uh, so you get the stream of thousands of thousands of Eritreans leaving this country. Um, and it is not only Eritrea, but um, the Horn of Africa in particular, also Somalis. And then you go to, to East Africa, you're, sorry, you go to West Africa, you have Nigerians escaping, particularly the North uh, of, of Nigeria escaping Al Shabaab. Obviously, um, with these people, there are what we term as economic migrants. But again, even when we refer to economic migrants, let us also keep in mind that when you have economic migrants coming to Europe and working, they send remittances back home, and they are people, so one person working in Europe would be supporting a whole family, 10 people or 20, 20 people back home. So the issue is not, is not that simple. It's multi-layered. And OK, yes, today we're focusing very much on, on, on refugees coming from Syria. But there's a, there is a reality in Africa, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, that should not be underestimated. I want to give an opportunity. Professor Neil Doshi from French and Italian. So um, thank you very, very much. Um, Martin, in one of your previous uh, comments, you suggested that MOAS is in contact with Italian state organizations. And uh, this is actually a question, so then therefore addressed to both, perhaps mostly to Martin Alessandro, but open to to Joanna as well. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the networks in which you're involved. What opportunities are there for you to, for MOAS, for, for instance, to collaborate with other aid organizations? And I'm actually curious about your hopes You've spoken about the need for this, for, for a global responsibility, a global response to this. I'm wondering, on the ground, in terms of practical, uh, practical organization of aid efforts, 
What are your hopes? What would you like to see more of from either state organizations, um, the EU, or the UN even? Yeah. First of all, um, when it comes to hope, um, uh, I would like to, at this point, reflect the hopes of our founder. Um, um, MOAS was founded by a 34-year-old American from Louisiana. He lives in Malta. He's been in Malta living and running his business from here for a few years. So there is, there is a very, very strong uh, um, um, American connection in what we do. Um, what Christopher Catronbone brings to the table is what he refers to as his American spirit. And in Europe, normally, um, we tend to look towards the state as an any state. I've come, working with Chris, I've come to realize that um, what he brings with, with his perspective, which is an American perspective, is this idea that, that the, of the power of the citizen, the citizen has a responsibility not to act as a bystander, but also to act. Um, so again, our hope is that MOAS um, inspires others um, to, to reply in a certain way. Um, Christopher and Regina Catrambone, Christopher, as I said, is American. His wife, who is also the co-founder, is an Italian from southern Italy, um, want to stand up to what Pope Francis has referred to as uh, as uh, as this this culture of uh, indifference um uh, so so yes um i think we need to do that in terms of our relationship with the italian authorities in particular i do need to i feel compelled to to underline that out at sea um we all pull the same rope truly um the the rome rescue coordination center and the, the Italian Navy and the Italian Coast Guard in particular have worked very, very, very hard in providing um, support to those, again, that feel no option but to cross. Um, so there is, um, out at sea, there are people working together, not only state entities and entities like us, like MOAS, but also the shipping community. As Joanna has said earlier, um, migration um, in, in the Mediterranean has been consistent for the past 15 years. And uh, um, we need to, to highlight the good work of, of, of also of done by state entities in saving thousands and thousands of lives at sea. However, what we say is that um, up until there is one person dying at sea, then the need there, is, there needs to be a unified response, um, response that wants to, tries to mitigate as much as possible um, loss of life at sea. But yes, um, um, our hope is that there is increasing uh, cooperation um, because it is only, particularly when you're doing search and rescue at sea, it is only through coordination and cooperation that you move forward. We see this from the perspective, again, of people who take to sea. And people take to sea fully aware of the dangers they are running. Uh, but again, when you take that decision, you, people are taking that decision feeling that really they have no option. I have on a relay a question from one of our graduate students in Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Um, so the question is, um, given the examples we've seen with Poland recently and, and other countries enacting border controls and vowing not to accept refugees, is the relocation policy collapsing? Well, I mean, the relocation uh, uh, policy has barely even started. I mean, there was like this big uh, hullabaloo and press conference when they, you know, when they relocated like, you know, six families from Greece to Luxembourg. I mean, there are like 100,000 left. I mean, it's uh, it, 100,000 people left. It's going really slowly. And, uh, and yes, this is a pro it's a problem now when you've got like the, the Polish government newly elected, the Croatian government's newly elected, and both of them are not big fans of um, the EU's policy on immigration, and they don't 
really want any migrants to come to their countries. Now, this is the new government's policy. The previous governments in Croatia and Poland uh, tried very hard to change public opinion. But again, as I mentioned earlier, they lost to populism, uh, to pretty base populism. Um, in fact, I, I think I remember when, when I was in Slovakia, one of the Polish students uh, at this conference that I, that I spoke at told me that one of the, the campaign ads in Poland was ISIS. They'll cut off your heads. We'll cut your taxes. I mean, that was like an actual campaign ad, and people voted for these guys. So again, base populism is 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 working. So as far as the relocation policy, there was resistance from some of these governments before, and it's only it's it's either going to derail it, it's going to make it slower, but. The, the main players in the relocation policy, Germany, uh, the European Commission, um, the, uh, Sweden, they continue, those governments continue, and especially Angela Merkel, continue to say this is the right thing to do. Uh, perhaps needs to be reconfigured the way uh, people are uh, screened. Maybe there has to be more serious discussions with Turkey about where to site some of these screening centers. Maybe they should be sited in, in, in Turkey so people don't have to make the, the extremely dangerous journey overseas. Um, but it, it's not dead, but it, 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 is in, it, is, it appears to be on life support at the moment. And if I could use a very overused uh, metaphor there. I'm going to allow one final question before we close. Okay, this is a <clears throat> excuse me. This is a question for Alessandro Bertani, and I was wondering if you could describe because I know that Emergency has locations in Italy to help refugees, and so I was wondering if you could describe the conditions that refugees live in once they get to Italy. I know that under Berlusconi, these centers um, were compared to detention camps or even concentration camps by some people, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that situation. Um, and what their living conditions are once they reach Italy. Oh, I'm sorry, um, the line is very bad now. Uh, the, the first question, uh, if I correctly understood, uh, is uh, whether we have uh, programs in Italy to uh, yes. help migrants. Migrants, is, is, what, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, since uh, 2006, we've been working also in Italy. Uh, we do pro provide uh, healthcare to uh, persons in need, uh, whatever, uh, whoever they are, where, wherever they come from, uh, Italians and uh, uh, migrants. Um, in the past years, we have uh, opened more and more centers in Italy. We have now uh, a health center in uh, Palermo, Marghera, um, Polistena, Napoli, Castel Volturno, and also uh, we have mobile clinics uh, uh, on the ground, uh, helping people uh, who move uh, in the country. Uh, you know, we have um, a large number of uh, uh, migrants uh, who now work uh, uh, in picking up uh, vegetables and fruits uh, all over the seasons. And so they move uh, uh, in the countries, in the country, uh, in Italy, and uh, um, we have mobile clinics uh, to help them uh, in uh, those remote uh, areas of the country. And the second part of the question I missed at all because of the line. So I was asking, um, I know that in the past, Can you repeat the, it, like please? the Centri di Accoglienza, for example, these, these centers and these camps where people were being sent were criticized in the past for their living conditions. And I was wondering if you could yes. tell us if those conditions have changed um, and, and how so. So what is, what is the experience of a person living in one of these um, detainment camps? Well, we have no direct uh, experience in those camps because we have decided uh, as an internal policy not to work within the, those camps mm -hmm. because we don't we don't agree on uh, you know on the policies that they adopt uh, within those camps so i can only um, probably share the information that you have uh, from the media um, the conditions, uh, the living conditions in those camps are very bad um, because people. Uh, um, are kept uh, for months and months before uh, uh, being allowed to leave the camp, uh, uh, move in the country, because of the um, uh, identification process uh, are very long. 
um, according to us, there is no efficient uh, um, response in terms of medical uh, uh, assistance and also hygiene. Um, so the, the, the situation for those camps is very critical. We do assist uh, people uh, outside those camps. Uh, once they are made free, and, uh, they need uh, uh, medical assistance and also orientation. Because uh, don't forget that uh, Italy has one of the most uh, um, efficient uh, health system in the world. And also legislation who uh, guarantees uh, rights to uh, the people in need. So, as part of our work, uh, in addition to the medical assistant, uh, we, we have also uh, cultural mediators who help people to uh, reach uh, the national health systems uh, um, uh, clinics uh, in order to be assisted by the uh, national health system. So we uh, explain uh, people how to uh, reach those uh, structures, those facilities, uh, what their uh, rights are and uh, what they can do to live in, uh, in Italy. So not, not only from a medical point of view, but also in terms of social rights. Let me, um, let me I promise not to um, um, burden our panelists more than an hour and a half, and we've come to that limit. And I want to extend to Alessandro Bertani, Martin Zwerev, and Joanna Kakiskis our heartfelt thanks at a difficult and stressful time for them to spend time with us explaining the aspects of this issue. We really appreciate it, as do our partners, whom I thank at Illinois, uh, uh, FIU, and North Carolina, and a few others listening remotely. Our, we hope the video of this will be posted on our website uh, very soon, and we extend our sincere thanks to you for participating. Bye-bye. <laughs>